Hello, y'all. I am Mary Williams, and I am happy to be chosen to be presenting God's Word for the next four weeks from Mace Hall at First Baptist Lancaster. Um, if I'm correct, First Baptist Lancaster is one of the older buildings on the First Baptist campus, and um, it really speaks to me in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, I feel the uh, Christians' hearts in this space who work to build this building. I have heard stories from uh, church members telling me how their fathers helped with the construction at different phases. And uh, I just really like the wooden floors that are in here and the room has such a charm to me. And uh, it's kind of has a feeling to me of being like your grandmother's house. And the floors creak a little bit and it just has a real connection to me of long ago memories of family times. So um, I hope that you can uh, connect with your place of worship and that there are different places on your church campus that speaks to you as this does to me. And uh, Mace Hall is also the location of Holy Ground's coffee shop. Um, it's the First Baptist Welcome Center for guests and members to fellowship together uh, from 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings until 9.40 when Bible study starts. Uh, did I mention coffee and light pastries? Because we have that. Um, Holy Grounds is a ministry of First Baptist Church Lancaster to reach out to the community to promote spiritual values and Christian beliefs. So please think about us in the future, the coming weeks, as we reopen holy grounds and uh, can fellowship together again. So I think our uh, promotion says that we're going to have a study on Ruth. And when we study God's Word, we need to read the Bible. So I'm reading from uh, the New International Version of the Bible. And uh, long ago, the Bible did not have subtitles and it wasn't broken down into uh, sentences and paragraphs and sections, but that's what we have now. So our beginning subtitle starts out with Naomi loses her husband and sons. It just jumps right in. So verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. So I had to look up the word Epaphrathite, which described them as they were people from Iprath, which was not too helpful. And it told me that the names in the Bible were associated with Bethlehem. Iprath is Hebrew, that means fruitful. Bethlehem means house of bread. And the Bible scholars that I researched from said that they believe that Iprath was the ancient name from the Canaanite city and that Bethlehem was the Jewish name for the same city. Okay, verse 3. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Um, doing a name search, I was interested in what their names were. Elimelech means God is king, or it means my God is king. And Naomi's name meant to be pleasant. Farther on in our story, we're going to see that Naomi changes her name to Mara, which means bitter. And then the sons, Malon and Kilion, reflect sickness and wasting. And perhaps that's a reference to their premature death, or their names could have been given by reason that they were uh, plagued with feeble health their whole life. Ruth, the star of our story, her name means in Hebrew, a companion or friendship. And we certainly see that in her throughout this story. In English, Ruth's name means compassion, which we also see that she displayed throughout their trials in her life with Naomi. And 
Orpah. That was one of the most interesting ones to me. Her name means a fawn or a lively maiden or back of the neck, which was very curious to me, and I'll explain in a few minutes what that came out to mean. So the names of the store, the people in this story reflect who they were and some of their personality traits, uh, which I think is something to think about. And what does our name say about us? That's a bit of a question that we all need to personally answer. So back to our uh, Bible verse. The second part says, Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. She and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? And I am not going to have any more sons who could become your husbands. Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter, clue to her name, for me that you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So that was a clue to me where Orpah's name, Orpah's name came from, was when she left, what was the last thing that Naomi saw of her but the back of her neck? And I thought that was a very interesting little tidbit of information that I'd never thought about. So verse 15 says, Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Lowercase. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. And here's our famous quote from the Bible. Here, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death separates you and me. When Naomi really realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women ex exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So I wanted to give you a little background on the study sources that I have had. I found a really terrific book written by a lady, Carolyn Custis James. And she wrote the book that I have been reading from the Gospel of Ruth, uh, Loving God Enough to Break the Rules. And I hope that we can see some of that through the study. And also, uh, Chuck Swindoll is also a very great reference. And his insights of Bible application guide have been very helpful in searching out the scriptures and getting the meat part of the story. So as with the books of the ancient Bible history, we don't have conclusive evidence of who wrote the book of Ruth, although many say the prophet Samuel wrote the book. 
and you're probably aware that the book was written for the people of Israel somewhere after the period of Judges from 1375 to 1050 BC. That was a very dark period of time in Israel's history. And during that time, the people of Israel were living by just pleasing themselves and not God. Judges 21-25 says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Chuck Swindoll's Bible Application Guide tells us about the tragic early history of Israel and the Promised Land. The Israelite culture had become completely saturated with the pursuit of selfish desires. Sounds a little like now. God's chosen people had gone from having admirable leaders who were willing to defend their people to being controlled by compromised leaders and priests who sacrificed the lives of their own subjects to protect their self-serving ideals. The people were corrupt and took what they wanted in life and could only be led truly by brute force. Can we conclude then that Israel was content with their lives of sin? <clears throat> so uh, part of the study uh, brought out that if the Israelites were to have a king, he would have had to compel their allegiance by forcing such things as taxing the people and conscripting young men into the army and other heavy-handed measures. But the Spirit of God gives us, His people, freedom to choose goodness over selfishness. Living that choice requires a counterculture approach to life that puts less emphasis on common comforts and the status quo in favor of sacrificial acts for the good of others. So, um, into our back to our study, this was a time after a great famine in Judah that caused Naomi's family to find refuge in Moab. The story of Naomi and Amalek begins with history and the journey of the family from and their two sons from to the uh, land of Moab for food. Uh, according to the Life Application Bible Study, uh, we were uh, informed that marrying a Canaanite was against the law as recorded in De Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4. And Moabites were not allowed to worship at the tabernacle because they had not let the Israelites pass through their land during the exodus from Egypt. Um, so it's ironic that Ruth was a Moabite that God used as an example of genuine spiritual character. Um, the Moabites were a tribe of people who descended from Moab, who was one of the sons of Lot, who was the nephew of Abraham, as we find in Genesis 19.37. Moab was one of two sons born to Lot's daughters after they had uh, decided that there was no option for them to bear children, so they had an incestuous relationship that created the birth of these children. Uh, Moab was born first, and his name sounded in Hebrew like the word for from father. Uh, despite the strange nature of Moab's birth and the development of his people, history records many important insights regarding his legacy. Uh, during the time of the judges of Israel, the Moabites had constantly oppressed the Israelites for 18 years until finally Eglon, the king of Moab, was assassinated by Ehud, one of the Israelite judges, as we see in Judges 3, 12 through 30. Uh, so uh, there was a marked enmity between Moab and Israel. Uh, some of the perspectives that I have discovered researching the book of Ruth was that first, God is the true hero of this story. We seem to substitute Ruth and our favorite character in place of God because we want to get to the, the happily ever after story of Ruth and Boaz. We also find the insights about God and his relationship with his people and if we fail to put God first in the story of Ruth, 
we will miss the main message. Uh, second, I found something really interesting that the story of Naomi and Ruth are from the legacy of Eve. And that was a bit surprising because what does Eve have to do with Boaz and Ruth? But we are told in Genesis 1.27 that God created Eve in his image to be an image bearer. And that God created mankind in his own image. And also Eve was an azer. The word is spelled E-Z-E-R, but I was told it was pronounced Azer. And Azer is a strong helper. And Eve was Adam's helper. In the Old Testament, Azer refers to God as Israel's helper in times of trouble. The Azer is a warrior which holds far-reaching implications for women in every relationship, season, and walk of life. God created Eve with the mission as the Azer to be Adam's staunchest ally in life of faith, fulfilling the cultural mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve. And we all, I hope, know the cultural mandate was a command from God to the, develop the social world, build families, cities, including schools, governments, and laws. The second mandate was to subdue the earth, to harness nature, plant crops, build bridges, compose music, and even design computers. That was all in God's plan. Therefore, the verse in Genesis tells us that our original purpose was to create cultures and build civilizations. Uh, together, Adam and Eve exercised dominion over the earth and worked to advance God's kingdom in their hearts. Eve and all of her daughters, women today, are azers, strong warriors who stand along with their brothers in the battle for God's kingdom. God created a powerful union that was essential for man and woman to face the challenges of the world together. Every woman's life changes with the seasons and circumstances, but God's calling for her never changes. We are God's image bearers and we are azers. As image bearer, our chief purpose is to love the Lord, her God with her whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And those are references from Deuteronomy 6, 5, Matthew 22, 37, Mark 12, 30, and Luke 20, 27, which to me makes it very important that we understand that. As the Ezer, we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Leviticus 19, 18. Eve, beginning with her husband, but also in encompassing every person that we encounter. And isn't that what Ruth does with her relationship with Naomi? Uh, we're not given a whole lot of information about Ruth and her first husband, but we know conclusively, and we don't know which brother she married. But by her actions, I presume that Ruth was the azer to her husband, and it seems that it came by her instinctively. Um, so back to Naomi's story. We start here to be filled with awe and gratitude with the transforming power of God's goodness in women's lives and to be overwhelmed by the larger vision of what God can do through us today. We see what caused the family to leave Bethlehem in, this family, in the famine. However, we don't see that they prayed or they really considered God's will while it's not impossible that they may have at least on the surface attempted to ascertain God's will, the evidence points in the direction that the decision was made in the flesh. In other words, they weighed alternatives according to their own understanding, decided to leave and go to Moab. So now we're back to the verse, Judges 21-25, where people did only what they wanted to do. God should be first and in the middle and the last consideration whenever we have an important decision. If you really want to know God's will, uh, it's generally that not hard to find out. Uh, the Bible tells us what to do. Prayer should be included in our decisions about what to do. Uh, 
counsel of other godly believers. Don't ask your friends who are going to agree with you. Find someone who's going to give you the truth. Uh, God ordains circumstances to give us a yes or no answer. And our freedom in Christ gives us the uh, ability to go to Him and ask the questions and find out what He wants us to do. Um, the story of Naomi and her downward spiral of suffering can also be compared to Job, whose story of testing, of his devotion and strength of will in God and Satan's epic battle uh, shows us how Job remained faithful despite his suffering. He was a man greatly tested by God and even more greatly blessed by God. So by con contrast, Naomi was tested by the loss of her husband and her sons. She also ultimately lost one of her daughter-in-laws who returned back home to her family. Uh, she, for a time, lost her homeland and her security. Uh, now we're going to see how God blesses Naomi's faith, even at times when she questioned God about her circumstances. So... In my womanly nature, we always ask questions and we always want to know why. So have you ever considered what Naomi was thinking as she examined the ruins of her life? What do you think Naomi was thinking when she contemplated what she believed about God? The God in which she had believed in since she was a child. Did Naomi contemplate rejecting God? What did her daughter-in-laws think after experiencing and witnessing this tsunami that swept away Naomi's entire world? Orpah and Ruth witnessed Naomi's loss of her sons, who were their husbands, and were also caught up in the tidal wave of Naomi's sorrows that at the same time were drowning in their own grief. Like Job, Naomi's world happened over a span of years of heartache and tragedy. Unlike now, there were no safety nets for Naomi. Grief was a long time coming. Years of disappointment, setbacks, and personal losses that are covered in a few short verses that provide little information about her actual sorrow and deep loss. So um, in my study, the severity and magnitude of Naomi's loss of her husband and sons in past times in you know Sunday school class and you're in a hurry and different studies and different teachers uh, we're kind of in a hurry to get to the good part about Ruth and Boaz so we just kind of forget about Naomi and sidestepping Naomi's shattered life we miss the real power of this story a story of a woman's struggle with God and if we dismiss Naomi's agonies we miss the impact of her doubts about God and the power of the gospel of Ruth and the famine was a frightening humanitarian crisis that sent her family across the border, they thought, to safety. Uh, so do you think that Naomi's family's reaction to the famine, which was a lack of food, registers with some of us as we experience shortages of groceries and toilet paper in the past weeks that we have had a uh, new life to come upon us? And what does that say about us if we're able to gloss over the word famine in the biblical text without even acknowledging what the word actually means? So, you know, going back, uh, Naomi, what was she thinking on the journey from Bethlehem, leaving her home, leaving her friends, leaving her church, and leaving her security? We know that the famine was only the beginning of her troubles. Have you ever moved to a different city? Have you ever moved to a different state? Ever lived in a foreign country? How do you feel? You don't blend in. Things work differently. Processes that were routine are suddenly no longer normal. Perhaps now we are gaining some insight into Naomi's feelings about her move to Moab. Immigrants are not always accepted by inhabitants. In our politically charged atmosphere now in America, there are many obstacles on both sides to overcome between immigrants and inhabitants. Layered on top of that was the long history of political tension between Moab and Israel, which did not make things any easier. 
<clears throat> but gradually the family of Elimelech, Naomi, and their sons began to settle into life in Moab. They established a household and became comfortable, became friendly with neighbors most likely, adapted to life in Moab, understood, and perhaps in a kind of a way, accepted the Moabites' worship of idols. So Naomi never expected her husband to die in Moab. That wasn't part of their search for security. Elimelech's death occurred on foreign soil. The Jewish burial practices in Bethlehem were likely not able to be carried out in Moab. Naomi never envisioned that her family's great adventure would turn into her biggest nightmare that she could never escape. Now Naomi was a single parent in a foreign country. They have no relatives close or distant. Also, there is no support provided to Naomi as the sole provider for two sons. Perhaps Malon and Kilion had to find a job. Perhaps they had to quit school to help support their mother. Her sons were her future, especially now that their father was dead. In their culture, a woman's value was measured by the number of sons. Therefore, at least Naomi was worthy of honor for giving birth to Malon and Kilion. And the family line of Elimelech would continue and she would have sons to care for her in her old age. When their father died, neither Malon or Kilion were married. The family was ultimately stranded in Moab without choices for Jewish brides. Also in the ancient culture, the groom's father arranged the marriages. We're not given details of how uh, Malon and Kilion's marriage to Orpah and Ruth happened. It's likely that Moabite fathers would not be inclined to give away their daughters to Jewish foreigners. Perhaps the clue here is that Naomi tells Orpha and Ruth to go home to their mothers, Ruth 1.8. Perhaps either Orpah or Ruth's father were not alive to arrange their marriage to young men from a foreign country. After Naomi's son's marriages to Orpah and Ruth, things did not get any better. Neither Orpah or Ruth could conceive grandchildren. We know from Bible study that procreation was highly valued in the ancient culture, and her daughter-in-law, including Naomi, were counting the days, months, and years, waiting and waiting and being disappointed that there were no children. This was another catastrophe. The lineage of Elimelech depends on the birth of at least one male heir. Survival was everything. Surely, Naomi begged God to step in and stop the madness. Did Naomi ask God, where, where, it, where are you? Didn't God know that they needed help? Didn't God know that the future of her family was hanging in the balance? God, why aren't you listening to Naomi's prayer? So we're just about out of time for this week. Uh, the time goes a lot faster than I planned for it too, and I have more materials, and I am very excited about this study and looking forward to being with y'all next week. Um, as we close, I want to uh, say a prayer for us that we will um, see each other next week and that God will guide our paths. So if you would join me in prayer. Our Father, Creator, maker of heaven and the universe we are thankful for your grace and mercy for each of us your children <clears throat> we are thankful for your encompassing love that is amazing and overcomes our weakness and sins father thank you that there is no storm that you won't carry us through thank you that there is no bridge that you won't help us across thank you that there is no battle that you won't help us win Thank you that there is no heartache that you will help us through. Lord, you are so much bigger than anything we will ever face. Lord, we come before you today and we leave everything in your hands, confident that you embrace each day knowing that you will take care of our needs. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus to release us from our sins, that we are forgiven because there is nothing that we could ever do to break the chains of sin. I thank you and I praise you for the Bible where we can search and find answers 
when we are lost. And I pray for everyone watching today that they will seek your face and find you. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And I look forward to seeing y'all next week. I hope you will be excited to see me next week. Thank you.